morning. Good morning. You know, just as we uh, begin a new series, I just want to take a moment and uh, just welcome everyone from Kittery Point and Raymond and just say together as an entire congregation, we've just been through 10 weeks in a study called Rooted. Many of you have been part of home groups, um, been uh, part of uh, making some new friends in those 10 weeks, and uh, I trust that that has been um, a huge you know, uh, boost to your own personal walk with Jesus. It's why we do this. We want everybody that is associated with Bethany Church at the end of their days, man, to be able to be very fluent in how they speak Jesus. You know, when you get to heaven, it's going to be the language of heaven. We, uh, we read in a very um, interesting passage in 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about love, being patient, kind, not proud, right? Not easily angered, keeping no record of wrongs, right? It ends that passage by saying love never fails. And then it goes on to say that, uh, um, that uh, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Because in heaven, you're not gonna need faith because you're gonna see everything for what it is. In heaven, you're not gonna need hope because all things are gonna be realized. What are you gonna hope for when you already possess it? But in heaven, there's gonna be love in a way in which you and I now can only really imagine what that would be like. So we have to learn how to speak Jesus now so when we get to heaven, we're fluent. Along that, um, we're gonna start a new series. It's called Illuminate. It's for a study in the book of 1 John. One of the things I just want to say right off the bat is um, as, a, as a pastoral staff, um, we included um, uh, Dan Elliott, uh, Brett Olson, uh, Pastor Shea, Pastor John, all of them together, and we wrote daily devotions for the, all the weeks through this series, just like in your Rooted book. And if you get on our website at bethanychurch.com, you'll see this banner for this new series, Illuminate. If you hit that, you'll get a download of all the devotions for that week. So it's a way for us to continue to grow together. I hope you are going to stay in your groups. um, And maybe we're in the process of forming some new ones. If you want to be in a group, all you have to do is go to our next steps, and they would uh, be happy to accommodate you. It's better when we learn together. And uh, we challenge one another to just learn a little bit more about what our faith is all about. So why don't we just pause for a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll begin a new study. Father, I want to thank you so much for what you have done in uh, the months prior to, the, to today. There have been many who have learned some deep truths, begun some new disciplines. We are finding ourselves, Lord, growing closer as a community All of these things, Lord, are so important because you want your people to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Just letting our light shine so others may see our good work and glorify you, our Father in heaven. So I pray that all these studies that we engage in would not be truths that we just gather for information, but these truths would sink from our head to our heart influencing our actions, Lord, in the way in which we live, all to give you honor and glory. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Have you ever had somebody lie to you or about you? (laughs) It can be very distressing, can it? It can, um, lies, once they begin to spread, it can affect deep-seated friendships. They they begin to sour. All of a sudden, you start worrying about things like your reputation. You worry how many people are being told these lies about you. You start to worry that maybe this is going to influence people and it could affect your livelihood. It could affect your family. You, you, when you become aware of how all these lies are just being spread about, if you're not careful, it, it, it could leave you exhausted, it, paranoid even, isolated. 
I uh, had a conversation with uh, a person who was had a very public, you know, um, very public job. And um, one time I had uh, an opportunity to sit down and share a meal with this individual. And uh, I asked him, um, how does he handle all the public criticism? He was an ambassador for the United States and um, was in a particular field where he was constantly being bombarded. And uh, he was a Christian. And he said, one of the things that I've learned to do is I've taken the, in the criticism, I try to take the kernel of truth and I try to blow away the chaff. And, um, and that made me think, you know, since that point, like, the way I try to deal with that, even in my own personal life, is first thing I do is I, rec I recognize that I, I just have to pray about this because if I don't, the root of bitterness can begin to grow up inside of you. So you have to pray and then pause and then try and regain a sense of perspective. I, I remember listening uh, or reading this verse that's found in the book of Hebrews. It's a, it's a very interesting text. It's speaking about Jesus. It says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Think about all the criticism that Jesus came under. And he was perfect. So I, I read a text like that and I think, yeah, Jesus had to deal with all kinds of opposition, all kinds of malintent, the spreading of lies. Which is why, like this book of 1 John kind of caught my attention because the book of 1 John was written to a church that was experiencing a great deal of internal turmoil. It was a church now that not only were having some really theological debates, but also there were relational problems that were beginning to, uh, to, to surface. And um, they were a church now that were, um, they were a number of false prophets who were among them that were making false claims about themselves, about Jesus, and seeking to undermine the message of Jesus. And their intent was to lead many away from the truth that Jesus had been proclaiming and now is being proclaimed by the apostles. And so, evidently, this conflict caught the attention of the apostle John. And so John sees it for what it is and now he begins to address all of these lies that are taking place within this community. And he warns them. Let me just give you a little, a couple of verses that just show you the mindset of the Apostle John. He says in 1 John 2, 26, he says, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. And he adds to that, in chapter three, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. So John is warning them of these false prophets who are misinformed and misdirected. What he wants to see is that the community of believers now, they coalesce around an informed faith and an obedient life and a heart that is reflecting God's heart. And so, if the church, the body of believers, right, if we're just supposed to come together, regardless of the challenges that we face in this life, it's going to be necessary sometimes for you and I to confront some of these lies. It's going to mean that we have to know the truth well enough to uncover the lie. And the wisdom of 1 John is going to illuminate that path forward so that in the end we have a faith that is resilient and overflowing with confidence and so that's what John wants us to learn as we go through this book we've just finished spending 10 weeks talking about theological truths that should be at the very foundation of what we believe 
We talked about who God is. We talked about how we can speak with God, how God speaks to us. We talked about sin that was in the world and the strongholds that it creates. We talked about where is God in the midst of suffering. We talked about our best life ever being seen as we serve one another, as we have compassion for one another. Why and how it's so important for us to share this story with others. And why the church is so important. Those are all foundational truths on which we could begin to build this life of faith so that we speak Jesus. In the real world, though, there's all kinds of opposition. And that's what John is going to help us to, um, to confront. So I'd like to start this morning by reading to you the first four verses that act as a prologue to this book. And it says this. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared and we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have a fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Now, in this morning, I want us to go back and just take a closer look at what's in John's mind. It's worth noting that the opening verses actually give us a hint on what the rest of this book is about to you know, uh, you know, reveal to you and to me. It's a number of these concepts that he's going to direct towards this conflict that is taking place in the church. So I want us to now go back to verse one and I want you to follow along with me here because there's just a couple of things that I, I want to just lay down as a foundation as we begin this study together. Verse one says this, it says, that which was from the beginning. Isn't that kind of odd? There's no introduction as to who the author is. There's no real pointing out to the congregation. So there is an intimacy here that is presumed. It's like how many times you text a friend, right? And you're not saying, hey, this is, you know, they know who you are. It's, it's in this line of text, but if somebody just saw it isolated, they wouldn't really know who was speaking to whom. But you look at this text and um, one of the things I want you to pick out from this text is that what John is doing here is that he's setting the record straight. And um, as he sets that record straight, there are a couple of things that, um, that, need to, that you need to be aware of. Like, first of all, you notice in that text, it was all about we. Can we go back to that te text in uh, verse one? Just, and you see here, right? He says, look, that which we have heard, that we have seen, that we have looked at and our, and, uh, and our hands have, have touched, right? This is all from a position of authority. This is the we in this text. Who's, who's John speaking of? He's talking about not only himself as an apostle, but also the other apostles that now have had an awareness of not only the person of Jesus, but the work of Jesus. They have seen it up close and personal in a way that others have not seen. They were with Jesus throughout his ministry, and they also personally have moved from a position of real doubt and question having to deal with all of those questions that were arising, all of that, uh, you, know, uh, un, you know, the awareness that was coming as to who Jesus was, even to the disappointment of, of their denial at the very end. But now the Spirit of God has fallen on them. They are once again emboldened and they are relentless. You read through the rest of this New Testament and the guys who seem to be a little wishy-washy, man, they are now strong in what they are doing and they are speaking out on this truth about Jesus. So what John is doing here, he is speaking from this position 
of authority. Their association with Jesus and his teaching are now going to be the bedrock for which they are going to confront many of the untruths that are around. So that leads me to the second point, and that is not only is John here talking about a position of authority, but he's also speaking as an eyewitness. We heard, we saw, we touched. It just lends credence to what he's going to say throughout the rest of this book. Not only that, what you're going to find is that John is speaking about a person. It's not just some theological concept. That which was from the beginning is a person. We refer to him as the word of life. He's the eternal life. All of this now is bringing to people the awareness of not only their position, not only what they have learned by being with Jesus, but also that Jesus truly came. And that, my friends, is going to be the issue in these first couple of verses. And you're going to see how that's going to play out in the rest of the book. But this is really important for us to to get a hold of. The following verses then just crystallize what John is trying to convey. These truths really are going to illuminate the path forward. What is that? Well, look at verse 2. It says, that life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So this verse is at the very core of what John wants to proclaim to them. This is now at the very core of of John's presentation. And so what are we to learn from this? Well, there's a couple of things. First, there's the, as I said, this is the core of the presentation, but what is he gonna say? He's gonna talk about Jesus as God. In verse one, didn't he allude to that? He said, that which was from the beginning. When does in your mindset now, that, that phrase, in the beginning, what is that do you think is an allusion to? Well, if John is the one who wrote this book, these, le- these letters, John is also the one that wrote the Gospel of John. And you might recall that when you open up the Gospel of John, what's the first verse in that text? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's a declaration that something new is about to unfold. Not only that, you go all the way back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Again, it begins to give us a frame of of, of reference on how everything began. So when John in this letter opens up that which was from the beginning, it's not speaking in terms of, of disclosing something new like Genesis or John because John is just trying to show that this Jesus, he, he just, just didn't come on the scene. He was from the beginning. He was eternal. And that's exactly his point here because he's trying to say that Jesus as God is eternal. He was from the beginning. That he is the eternal life, like it says in verse two. And not only that, but he was with the Father. This eternal life that was with the Father. So think about this in your head now. That means that this declaration of who Jesus is, it means that not only is he God, but he's also eternal as the Father, and he was distinct from the Father, so he had his own personality. All of which is underscoring that this Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that God sent to redeem the world. All those Old Testament promises. And you know some of them. Those passages like for instance in in Isaiah when every Christmas comes around and you write on a Christmas card and it says, it says, um, um, the virgin shall be with child and you shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. Or how about, you know, um, in uh, chapter 9, when it, when it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Texts that are 600 years before the birth of Jesus. 
Isaiah was giving them as a prophetic word about what was to come. And throughout the Old Testament, you will see that Jesus as Messiah, the promised one, is written about all over the Old Testament. And the New Testament writers are now pointing back to all those texts and saying, you do realize that what they were talking about is Jesus, who has come now in the flesh. And that's the point, that Jesus, God, has now come in the flesh. He's human, fully human. They said that our hands have touched him. Isn't that what we just read in verse 2? That this life appeared. He, was, he appeared to us, it says. All of which, again, just points out that this, this eternal personal God has now clothed himself with flesh. And why is that important? That's the whole point, though. You have to have in your head these two, you know, these two views about who Jesus is. That Jesus is not only God, but he's also fully human. And you sit back and you go, okay, you know, I, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe that Jesus is, you know, um, God's son. But, but why is this so important? Well, think about this with me. If Jesus is truly the son of God, then all of the claims that Jesus is making about who he is and about who the father is all of a sudden take a whole nother level of credibility. Because now God is the one who is revealing the will of his father. Numerous times that you'll read in the Bible where Jesus says, I have come to complete his task. That the words I speak to you are not my own, they come from my father. There are a number, a number of different places where Jesus' divinity is being marked out for us. And it's important because he's speaking as God. The truth that he's declaring is so that you and I would lay hold of that truth. It would become the bedrock on which we build our lives upon and it brings us a sense of confidence and hope. It's also important that we keep in mind his humanity. Because Jesus, why did he come? Do you remember those early verses when the angel comes, speaks to Mary, telling her that don't be, don't be afraid, what is conceived of you is what? Of the Holy Spirit. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. So it was absolutely important that Jesus be fully human because Jesus came to bear our sins on a cross. And so through his resurrection, you and I now have the gate by which we can enter into this kingdom of heaven. Let me just, I don't want to lose anybody this morning. Two things. Jesus is God. Jesus is human. Jesus is God so that he could speak truth. Pull the curtain back so that we can understand something about the mind of God. But he's also fully human because Jesus now comes on the flesh and he becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The truth about Jesus is referenced many times through the New, Old and New Testament. I'm going to give you just one reference. It's found in Hebrews chapter 1 in the opening verses. Listen to God describe how he is going to reveal himself to his creation. It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Those of you who are familiar with your Bible, just think about that for a little bit. What are some of those, you know, astounding ways in which God revealed himself? Can you not think about that great exodus? 
how God broke the back of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, how he opens up a sea and the people run through it, the manna from heaven. I mean, countless, countless amount of ways in which God has revealed himself in various manners at various times. But then notice it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. You ever think about Jesus like that? That before Jesus took on this flesh, he was with the Father, and he became the agency by which all of the world was created. We don't serve a little Jesus. <laughs> we serve a big Jesus. He created everything. Not only that, notice what it says about the sun. It says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. What that's saying is if you see Jesus, you've seen the Father. And, well, and doesn't Jesus say that? In, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 10, verse 10, it says, I and the Father are one. To which the Jews who heard it in that time, they began to pick up stones because they said, this man is blaspheming. He's making himself out to be God, which is exactly what Jesus has been telling them. But they didn't have ears to hear, hear or eyes to see. But this isn't just tell you that, does it? It's not saying alone that Jesus came to reveal the Father, that, that now God's ways are going to be revealed through what Jesus is going to say, but what else does it say? It says, after he had provided purification for sins. What does that mean? That's a nice way of saying he died for you on a cross. Your sins are forgiven because the Son of God came, took on this flesh, became the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. If Jesus didn't come in the flesh, you and I would still be in our sin. If he wasn't truly God, then he would have a nature just like you and me and would never qualify to be able to stand that kind of judgment. But being fully God and fully man, he fulfills the whole record of what God wants to do, reminding us in person what God's mind and will is, as well as offering the sacrifice that was needed for you and I to once again have a relationship with God healed. So after purification of sins, what happens? Now it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is once again glorified with the glory that he shared with the Father before the world began. Now can you read John 3.16 with a little bit more insight? That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because God was sending his Son, fully God and fully human, to accomplish the work that God was laying out. So Jesus has come to reveal the Father and his purpose. Jesus has come to give his life a ransom for the sins of man. And ultimately, Jesus came to restore us back into a relationship, not only with the Father, but with the Son through this Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse three now. Because this work then, has far-reaching implications. First John 1 says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You see that word fellowship? In other words, everything that John is about to tell them, all these untruths that he's gonna be confronting, is so that at the end of the day, your faith would have enough confidence in what God is teaching us through his son that it would result in you and I feeling that we have fellowship with God. I can know God. He's, he's a presence in my life every day. For that to happen, though, Jesus has to be who he says he is. 
And that's why John says, look, what we've heard, what we've seen, this is what we're proclaiming because our desire is for you to have fellowship with God. So this, this truth about Jesus being divine and human, I, I, I hope you see why that's important, but there's far-reaching implications of it. And this is why I want you to go a little deeper with me here. Because the implications are that we have fellowship with God. That means that you can know God. That means that he ought to be able to influence the way in which you live, your attitudes, your actions. It's not like your faith only becomes a little compartmental you know, space in my life. No, it bleeds over to everything about my life. It makes me a better husband. It makes me a more conscientious father. It makes me a better citizen, a better worker, because I recognize every day that I live, I'm going to have to give an account for my life to a God who sees everything that I do. And God has given me insight now. He's given me revelation so I don't have to guess what pleases God. And I have, thank, I have Jesus to thank for that. So one of the far-reaching implications is this one, that we have fellowship with God. And this isn't something that John just made up. I want to read to you what Jesus said on the eve before he would be crucified. When he gathered all his disciples together, this is what he tells them. He says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you catch that? One of the things that Jesus is saying to you and me is that you, in your innermost being, are going to experience what it feels like to be a child of God. But it only comes through your obedience to who he is. So if I act in a way that is disobedient, don't you think that that's going to disrupt this kind of intimacy, this kind of fellowship? Come on, we see that on a human level, right? Treat your friends badly. Do it consistently. And after a while, it damages that relationship, doesn't it? Do that with your spouse. And tell me how great it's going to be to feel like we're one. It damages every relationship we're in if we don't live by the truth in those relationships. So why are we going to think it's any different with Jesus? But Jesus is making you and me a promise. He's saying, the Father and I are going to come into you, make ourselves known. We're going to make that a home. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Oh, again, why it's important that you see that Jesus is God. He's speaking for his Father. Not only that, verse 25, all this I have spoken while still with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So now it's not just the Father and not just the Son, but now it's the Spirit of God, all three of them working together so that you and I would have fellowship with God. And not just this fellowship, look what he says. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Don't you see then that everything that Jesus is teaching us is so that we would never lose hope, that it would prevent us from experience, uh, it would prevent us from experiencing this peace and joy and fellowship with God. Everything that Jesus is about is so that we might know him more deeply. Because God is speaking to you. And if you begin to lack confidence in who he is, then you might be tempted to think, well, I don't have to listen. But the one who is speaking is a eternal, divine, personal son 
of God. So the impact of these truths that Jesus is God and man is meant to keep us from being afraid of the future. Because Jesus is taking the curtain and opening it up and saying, look what awaits you. Come, follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to experience this peace. I don't want you to be afraid. There's one more. It's in verse four. Verse four says, we write this to make our joy complete. So I told you that the implications of Jesus being God and man is so that our fellowship would be with God But verse four now tells us so that our fellowship would exist with one another. He writes, so that our joy would be complete. Now you can read these words as though John and his fellow apostles are imploring us to respond so that their hopes would be met. But that's not how to read this because this doesn't address the previous verse, which declares that John and his apostles are saying, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And now we want you to enter into that same fellowship so that together all of us can rejoice about this new standing that we have with a God who says he loves you and he gave his life for you. So John is underscoring these truths about Jesus' divinity and his humanity to illuminate the path forward for you and me. Truths that when properly understood are gonna impact us on a very deep level. These two truths are gonna be constantly referred to throughout the rest of this book. So in this opening verse, John is laying down the gauntlet. He's telling them, despite all the lies that they are being told, that Jesus is God. He is the promised Messiah. And as the Messiah, he has come to restore all things so that you and me, we can sit back and when shame or guilt or anything about our past rears its head, we recognize, no, we have a savior who died for me, who took my sins and placed them in the bottom of the sea, never to be remembered again. When life begins to unravel a bit, whether it's health or the loss of loved ones, you go back to this text that reminds you that this Jesus that has gone ahead is preparing a place for you so that where you are, where he is, you will be also. It helps me to know every single day that God has his eye on me, that if a bird doesn't fall to the ground without his awareness, he knows every hair that's on my head. He knows every step I'm gonna take. I have a confidence now in a savior, in Jesus who is God and man, who's gonna take me from this life into the one to come so I can live it with confidence. I can live it with a level of boldness. I can speak about things that still yet to be materialized because I have the word of Jesus to back it up. So I am not afraid. And in those moments, when I am being challenged by the the conflict that is within me and the conflict that's in the world, I go back to what Jesus said, what Jesus did. And my crooked paths are made straight. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Amen. Why don't we just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, in these verses, if we just take a little moment just to consider what is being said, It is this truth being boiled down to its very essence that Jesus is God and he's 
wants to reveal the heart of God to us. He's also our Savior who offers us forgiveness and grace so that we can live this life anew. I pray, Lord, that these truths would influence our everyday activity, that we would hold them in our thoughts as we continue through a study. Thank you for a revelation, Lord, that we can go back and read. Thank you for the presence of the Spirit that illuminates the path forward. And as always, we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen.